Hello and welcome to the Poetry Exchange. I'm Michael Schaefer. And I'm Fiona Bennett. Lovely to see you, Michael, as always. And you too, Fee. Well, we we didn't win the football. Are we, I don't know, are we allowed to talk about football on oh, Poetry Let's Exchange? not talk about Is football. That, maybe not, no. But, you know, they did us proud. They were a great example. Those boys are to us all. Mm. And the manager. Yeah. But did you see that woman catch that ball in the cricket? No, I haven't seen this. Ah, oh, I'll send it to you afterwards, Michael. But it reminded me of the Simon Armitage poem, The Catch, which is a brilliant poem in which he kind of inhabits the moment of the catch in slow motion in a poem. This particular catch by a cricketer whose name I don't know, I'm ashamed to say, uh, is just extraordinary. It's got to be the most extraordinary catch ever undertaken. It involves a moment of connection between her hand and the ball, a release of the ball due to the fact that she's running as she catches it and trips on the boundary. Wow. The ball comes out of her hand and then she reclaims it. This is extraordinary. I need to, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing this piece of video, but also reading this poem. I have a friend who uh, is, uh, is a brilliant catcher. And he will enjoy the poem. And oh. also, of course, Fee, you've brilliantly rescued us from drifting into being a sports podcast back into being a poetry podcast. Excellent work. Well done. It's my life's mission. <laughs> <laughs> all is well. To find the poetry in all. Yeah, that's great. Before we go any further, Fee, I did just want to give another shout out to Latitude Festival, which will be going ahead July the 22nd to the 25th. We will be there. Uh, on the last episode, I said we will be there in the podcast tent, which is all wrong. It's called The Listening Post. That is the name of the podcast tent. But that's where we will be. Uh, we're still not quite sure uh, what our slot is going to be yet. They're doing incredible work pulling a festival together at uh, a little bit shorter notice than perhaps they're used to, to say the least. But yeah, if you're uh, at a loose end for that weekend, there's not many better places to be. I'm not even sure if they've still got tickets left, but check out their website. And if you are going to the festival, come and say hi. We'll be there with two amazing guests. Oh, it'd be so lovely, wouldn't it? I mean, it was great last time we were there to to meet people and um, yeah, be in person somewhere with a, with a bit of a crowd. Because usually, of course, we're in person somewhere with just one or two people. Now, Michael, remind me who our guest is for this episode. We're very lucky to have a fantastic guest this month, Fiona. It's Anna Sampson, who is herself an anthologist. She uh, has put together, she's edited eight poetry anthologies, including She is Fierce and She Will Soar, as well as Night Feeds and Morning Songs. Uh, which is a collection of poems about motherhood. Anna was talking to John Preble and to Andrea Vitsky slot you and I weren't there, Fee, about a poem by Liz Berry, The Republic of Motherhood. The poem that's been a friend to Anna. Yeah, really, really so pleased to have you with us at the Poetry Exchange today. Um, we will, of course, get very swiftly to the poem that you've chosen to bring along. So, would you like to read it to us, Anna? Yes, I'll give it a go. I crossed the border into the Republic of Motherhood and found it a queendom, a wild queendom. I handed over my clothes and took its uniform, its dressing gown and undergarments, a cardigan soft as a creature, smelling of birth and milk, and I lay down in motherhood's bed, the bed I had made, but could not sleep in, for I was called at once to work in the factory of motherhood. The owl shift, the graveyard shift, feeding, cleaning, loving, feeding. I walked home, heart sore, through pale streets, the coins of motherhood singing in my pockets. Then I soaked my spindle bones in the chill municipal baths of motherhood, watching strands of my hair float from my fingers. Each day I pushed my pram through freeze and blossom down the wide boulevards of motherhood, 
where poplars bent their branches to stroke my brow. I stood with my sisters in the queues of motherhood, the weighing clinic, the supermarket, waiting for its bureaucracies to open their doors. As required, I stood beneath the flag of motherhood and opened my mouth, although I did not know the anthem. When darkness fell, I pushed my pram home again. By lamplight wrote urgent letters of complaint to the Department of Motherhood, but received no response. I grew sick and was healed in the hospitals of motherhood, with their long-closed isolation wards and narrow beds watched over by a fat moon. The doctors were slender and efficient, and when I was well, they gave me my pram again, so I could stare at the daffodils in the parks of motherhood, while winds pierced my breasts like silver arrows. In snowfall, I haunted motherhood cemeteries, the sweet fallen beneath my feet. Our lady of the birth trauma, our lady of psychosis. I wanted to speak to them, tell them I understood, but the words came out scrambled, so I knelt instead and prayed in the chapel of motherhood, prayed for that whole wild fucking queendom, its sorrow, its unbearable skinless beauty and all the souls that were in it. I prayed and prayed until my voice was a night cry, sunlight pixelating my face like a kaleidoscope. She's so good. (laughs) It really is amazing. I'll just start our conversation by asking what we always start with, which is, do you remember, Anna, when you first met this poem? Yes, I do. Well, I do remember reading it because I found it online. It was uh, it was on the Granter website and it went online in August 2017. So I'm thinking that was it was probably around then when I would have encountered it. And I remember reading it on on the web page. And because I read a lot of poems when I'm putting together anthologies, obviously, there are some that I feel I have a physical, you know, it feels like being smacked in the face. You know, I make a little noise where I go, oh, <laughs> you know, when I meet one that really has that impact on me. And this was one where I was really aware of myself doing the little, oh, you know, because I just, I'd never seen anyone writing about this like this. It felt so familiar to me. And actually I was interested to know how old my children were when I first read it. And so I think if it was August, 2017, my youngest was just over a year. So I was still kind of in this baby stage, but over the shock of that first baby stage, which I think is what she's talking about here, crossing the border. It takes me back so vividly to that feeling of the neighbourhood in which I'd lived for years, suddenly being completely transfigured and made strange. You know, that these were streets that I used to clip clop through in my high heels and my dress on my way to the office as an efficient, productive member of society, you know, um, rather than then for a year feeling like I was sort of shambling through them in my soft cardigan <laughs> <laughs> with a sort of thousand yard stare with, you know, sick in my hair and, you know, not having put a dress on for six months. And suddenly the neighbourhood is you know, the coffee shops you can breastfeed in and the pubs that are open at 11, but you can get your buggy between the tables. And and it just is a completely different place from the place that you knew before. And the bureaucracies, queuing for the bureaucracies. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and, and the actual sisterhood. It's, it's almost, yeah, as if you look up and you see, oh, yeah. Oh, there's other people here too. And yeah, we, I mean, there's that feeling too of, I haven't a clue what I'm doing, but here I am. I've arrived, and um, no, I, it, it it does do something. You are so right that that I've never seen done in in a motherhood poem either. Because what I kept thinking was my own experience, and mine is years ago. Uh, my 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 children are are older now, but it still brings it back as if it was yesterday and I remember the day I lay in the hospital and I remember feeling like I had passed through a glass mirror and I was suddenly watching the world like Alice in Wonderland from the other side of the mirror 
And I remember thinking, I know my mother now. I, I understand a part of her that I never understood before. And, and it, it's a weird, you, you didn't ask to be part of that. <laughs> it just is thrown on you. I, I felt a bit like I'd been parachuted out of my life into another life mm-hmm. with no instructions. You know, my friend yes. said, I had a job, you know, I had a job. I was good at my job. I've been doing it for 15 years. You know, I kind of knew what I was doing with my life. And then I had this new, and she talks about the factory. She said, I had this new job that was completely physical and I was supposed to know somehow what I was doing <laughs> and I didn't, you know, and it was, she, you know, that physical repetitive labor of it, the feeding, cleaning, loving, feeding, you know, but it's just a lot of wiping you know, yes. as well. It's no, a very I, menial, <laughs> sort of, yeah. it's, man, it's manual labor. I love that. The owl shift, the graveyard shift. Because yes. sleep is also out the window. I mean, there there is no, you, you never sleep the same again either. I'd, I'd love to have met this poem before I'd had children as well, because I'd love to know how differently I would have encountered it then. Do you think it would have, prepared you in any way or I don't know I'm I'm curious what what would you have engaged with it in the same way I expect I wouldn't because it wouldn't have struck such a chord with my own experiences I mean I think when she when she says then I soaked my spindled bones in the chill municipal baths of motherhood watching strands of my hair float from my fingers I felt I'd seen some stuff written about motherhood, though it is not a particularly, I mean, I think it is now a much more widely written about subject, but perhaps wasn't maybe 10 years ago or or longer ago. But that idea of the sort of physical toll on you, I don't think I was aware of, or maybe it would have prepared me. I, I was going to pick up on something you both said, actually, which was that you you didn't feel that you'd read a poem quite like this before about motherhood what was it that struck you so much about this one that you that you felt hadn't come through in the same way before I think there is a sense here of trudging with that thousand yard stare which was a lot of what my first months of motherhood involved my lovely daughter was not she was quite a cranky baby not a difficult baby in many ways but relatively cranky and one of the few times that she was sort of happy and content or asleep, which, you know, ran out into the same thing, uh, was while walking. So I did kind of walk for hours and hours and hours at a time. And I think that sort of trudging about, not really, you know, not really knowing what you're doing and being too tired to think about anything and queuing for bureaucracy and municipal swimming baths. She completely transfigures the mundane in this poem oh that's a great way to put it because I think that is part of the joy of the poem too the joy and the and the tragedy is that even without having children every single part of this one can relate to for example working a night shift I mean long ago I I I did work in a factory and worked the it was the three o'clock to the 11 o'clock at night shift I can tell you, yeah, <laughs> made me <laughs> determined to do something else with my life and, and to, you know, go, go on to college. But I remember it, how difficult that was. So, so there are sort of echoes of other things that come back to me. Now that you've experienced this, though, the, the, the motherhood um, sort of realm and, and republic, now that you live there. <laughs> now that you live there. No you you don't get to leave. <laughs> you're, you're a citizen. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious what you receive from it now. There's a sort of nostalgia, but also a relief, I think, to be past that phase. Bits of it seem, you know, quite humorous to me now in some ways. Where it's, you know, I stood beneath the flag of motherhood and opened my mouth, although I did not know the anthem. And I'm I'm sure that 
she's saying something much more profound than this, but it reminded me of all the rhyme times I went to early on, where everyone <laughs> seemed to know all the actions about the five little aliens and the, you know, and it's, you think, gosh, there's a whole, there's this whole other language. I don't speak this language. You know, I don't, I don't know what it means when you start talking about weaning. You know, I don't, I don't know how to do the nap maths of if you've had milk now and you need to sleep for an hour and a half at some point and then 40 minutes at another point and I've got to get some mulched up pear into you at some point. <laughs> you know, all of these things that seem quite arcane and terrifying at first uh, and then, of course, become second nature and you know how many spacemen went round the world and <laughs> how many ducks went <laughs> swimming over the pond. But I think as well, the the acknowledgement in the second half of the poem of how devastating those early months can, can be for people. And I think I had a, you know, I had a, a quite a smooth maternity leave. You know, my my children were kind of healthy. You know, there, there were no extra worries. I didn't suffer from postnatal depression. But I think anyone who's been through those months of sleep deprivation and, like I say, genuinely quite hard physical labour, you know, I've got a shoulder that's never going to be right again from all the late night, <laughs> you know, feeding, loving, changing, you know, all of that. I, I feel like that real acknowledgement of the the pain of other people, you know, other women who've been through that, I felt that very... That's something I've encountered again and again, where there's a sort of, not a secret handshake, but there's a sort of, over homeschooling was another time where I think um, people with young children who were at home, especially if they were trying to work as well, had a shorthand for how difficult that was, that sort of sisterhood in this. And, and she says, you know, I want to say I understand. I find that very moving. I remember someone saying to me when I was pregnant, nobody tells you how hard it is. It's really hard. Nobody tells you how hard it is. And I said, I think actually loads of people have told me how hard it is. It's just that I don't get it yet. <laughs> that actually, I, th I feel like actually some people had said, oh God, this is really quite challenging. Um, but you had to, you had to walk the streets of motherhood. <laughs> to understand that but with the first pregnancy if, if you're lucky you know you get quite cosseted as this precious vessel and then it's a bit of a shock when they're like okay you've gone through you know quite quite a big uh I had a emergency c-section so I'd, I'd lost two and a half liters of blood you know yeah. I would normally have been expecting to lie in bed for a bit to recover from that yeah. if it had been any other kind of operation but they're like right you're never sleeping again. <laughs> this is what you'll be doing. <laughs> so That's I so that... true. I mean, a, a C-section is major surgery. You should have six <laughs> weeks recovery time. <laughs> but, <laughs> but forget that. Yeah, you get the surgery and no recovery. You sort of go from being probably the most pampered you've ever been in your whole life. And everyone's like, no, no, let me take that to then sort of being on 24-7. <laughs> yeah, <here. laughs> yeah. Cool. And it is, it's quite a shock. I love that she says freeze and blossom in this bit and then later she says daffodils so we get that sense as well of the of the year kind of turning and I because I was spending so much time outside that I hadn't done previously uh, that feeling of being very close to the seasons even where I lived in southwest London you know, walking around the common and seeing the buds opening and things changing felt, you know, and it did feel on some slightly cliched level that it was, you know, new new life and the turning of the seasons and natural rhythms and you were somehow plugged into that in a new way. And I do remember as the seasons changed thinking, oh, I'll be able to show her squirrels, you know, I, a squirrel must have run in front of the pram. And I remember thinking, oh, at some point she'll be sitting up and I'll say, look, that's a squirrel. And she'll go nuts for that pun not <laughs> intended. You know, she, and that'll be really exciting. You know, the sort of 
there's something about children that does plug you into those seasons in a way that I feel perhaps I hadn't been before. I love that you talk about the the, the change through the poem because in the beginning it, it's quite a dark place. I mean, it's almost like forced labor. You know, you're you're going into this this country where here's your uniform, here's your shift. You have no choice. Sorry. And and even as it moves forward, even through the brighter moments of the daffodils, you know, we then look at the at the psychosis, Our Lady of Psychosis, Our Lady of Birth Trauma. But right next to that is the whole wild fucking queendom. It's sorrow. It's unbearable skinless beauty. So it just becomes suddenly it's forced on you, slave labor in a way, but then suddenly something sinks in and I I don't even know exactly what I'm asking you, but <laughs> that phrase, it's unbearable skinless beauty, every time yeah. I read that, I just think that's extraordinary. It's so kind of it's so visceral, but why why skinless there's there's a poem um i can't remember the name of the poet but it might be glenda bogan um where she said she's it opens with her saying motherhood peeled me raw and mm-hmm. she likens herself to a, a willow twig that had been peeled mm-hmm. i i related to that i felt i'd become much more susceptible much more of a cry baby (laughs) there's a new vulnerability in your children being out in the world Uh, in a novel I read she said it but my heart my heart is walking around in the world you know and I can't yeah and I I sort of thought the skinless beauty was a way in which she was saying that you're suddenly rawer than you were yeah, somehow, I don't know exactly what she did that brings that back so evocatively. And when she says the doctors were slender and efficient, I, I thought that was just such a brilliantly telling phrase. Mm. That was like everything that I had once been and was now not. <laughs> yes. It was slender and efficient. <laughs> yes. I used to be slender and efficient. <laughs> Those days are gone. Um, I thought that was such a brilliant line that she'd chosen those two you know that that feeling of competency that you feel that the narrator of the poem doesn't feel that they are competent and that's you know you don't know the words to the anthem I mean I'm just so it's amazing to hear particularly for me as the person here that hasn't been through this how this poem is so real to you but you're right there with the with every breath and (laughs) cleaning feeding cleaning loving feeding all of that i love the fact that everyone who reads this who has got those memories will be picturing the exact neighborhood through which they wheeled their buggy (laughs) but i love the fact that she's given everyone who had a a way to unlock those memories because the writing is just so vivid um, and I also think it can be a very lonely time and the poem expresses that. And at the end, there is this sense of connection, you know, all the souls that are in it. And I wanted to tell them that I understood, though it still feels like a lonely place. Then we end with that sort of being part of a that kind of community. How How would you describe this friend how would you define this friendship i feel like this is this poem is a good friend on a low at a low tired time i feel i feel seen in this poem i feel like experiences that i had that i didn't think were worthy of poetry suddenly in this poem here they were so like a a validating friend. The Republic of Motherhood by Liz Berry. I crossed the border into the Republic of Motherhood and found it a queendom, a wild queendom, 
I handed over my clothes and took its uniform, its dressing gown, and undergarments, a cardigan soft as a creature smelling of birth and milk, and I lay down in motherhood's bed, the bed I had made but could not sleep in, for I was called at once to work in the factory of motherhood, the owl shift, the graveyard shift, feeding, cleaning, loving, feeding. I walked home, heart sore, through pale streets, the coins of motherhood singing in my pockets. Then I soaked my spindled bones in the chill municipal baths of motherhood, watching strands of my hair float from my fingers. Each day I pushed my pram through freeze and blossom down the wide boulevards of motherhood where poplars bent their branches to stroke my brow. I stood with my sisters in the queues of motherhood, the weighing clinic, the supermarket, waiting for its bureaucracies to open their doors. As required, I stood beneath the flag of motherhood and opened my mouth, although I did not know the anthem. When darkness fell, I pushed my pram home again, and by lamplight wrote urgent letters of complaint to the Department of Motherhood, but received no response. I grew sick and was healed in the hospitals of motherhood, with their long, closed isolation wards and narrow beds watched over by a fat moon. The doctors were slender and efficient, and when I was well, they gave me my pram again so I could stare at the daffodils in the parks of motherhood while winds pierced my breasts like silver arrows. In snowfall, I haunted motherhood's cemeteries, the sweet fallen beneath my feet, our lady of the birth trauma, our lady of psychosis. I wanted to speak to them, tell them I understood, but the words came out scrambled, so I knelt instead and prayed in the chapel of motherhood prayed for that whole wild fucking queendom, its sorrow, its unbearable skinless beauty, and all the souls that were in it. I prayed and prayed until my voice was a night cry and sunlight pixelated my face like a kaleidoscope. That was Andrea with the gift reading at the end there. And our thanks, of course, to Anna for giving us permission to use the conversation and to Chateau and Windus for allowing us to use Liz Berry's fantastic poem. And what an absolute pleasure and a privilege and a joy to be able to share that conversation and that poem that I I know from several friends and poets and folk in the poetry loving world it's become an iconic poem that for a lot of people and has named things in a way that many women yeah hold hold dear so it's it's fantastic to be able to share it on the podcast and not least also of course because it won the forward prize for best single poem so it's it's also one of those poems that's had that great prize winning moment as well it should we're going to take uh, a month off we're going to have august off but if you are looking for some podcasts to fill your summer days on your staycations um we have a fantastic archive of conversations to to trawl through fee have you got a, a recommendation for if someone's looking for for a podcast for the summer Oh my goodness! Um, Particular episode that you like? Oh, you oh you've so many are jumping into my mind. Not particularly summer related, but I was thinking in the realm of um, of parent and child and so on. There was that fantastic conversation we had with the wonderful Hafsa Anila Bashir um, about On Children by Khalil Gibran, which I. I think was quite a while ago now so I just thought I've, I wanted to be reminded of it myself Michael mm. it's funny I, I suppose if you, if you did want another black country poet of course we have got a fantastic conversation with Roy McFarlane mm. uh, about his uh, his poem as friend which was The Negro Speaks of Rivers by Langston Hughes 
fantastic poem, terrific conversation, and of course many, many more for you to for you to have a listen through. And to stay in touch with us over that short summer break, always good to sign up for the newsletter and we can keep you posted with the autumn lineup of activity and exchanges that we're working hard to bring together. So do sign up via the website, thepoetryexchange.co.uk. We'll be back in September. And until then, thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.